So just to remind you that uh, you will receive a certificate of participation uh, with our with the, the the that you can use for your for your work or whatever, and uh, also a webinar handout in the next few days. Webinar handouts got all the important information from this webinar, including any worksheets you see, and it's also got some links to the videos that we're going to watch and uh, other things there. So, okay. If you don't receive that, you should receive it automatically. If you don't, for some reason, just email us at uh, Formazione and uh, we'll get that to you soon, okay? Anyway, um, as you may know, you can see from the map there, we're talking about a lot of countries, okay? And in fact, it includes over 2 billion people, okay? Not necessarily in English speaking countries, but English speakers themselves whether it's as a first language or second language or third or fourth, okay? it is over 2 billion people. And then we have, uh, uh, it's the largest number by number, language by number of speakers. Okay? So consider the fact that learning English really means joining a group that has members in every country and every, let's say every major city, I would imagine almost everything you could call a city in the world, you're gonna find some English speaker somewhere. Okay? Even if you restrict yourself just to countries whose main language is English, as we are today, you will find traditions, accents, and even dialects that differ significantly. Okay? It's, uh, I think it's really worth letting your students know this fact, as when they're learning English, you know, England, English often comes together, but uh, you know, as you can see from the map, we're talking about a lot of different areas in the world with a lot of different traditions. And uh, we're going to be exploring some of these today. Okay? Let us know which English speaking countries you've been to, uh, you know, which ones they are, where have you been, what traditions you like, and uh, have a look. As always, we have a few objectives and uh, we're going to be helping you create involving activities. To, uh, to explore Anglosphere countries, cultures and customs. We're going to be using accents and traditions and a little bit of slang to expand students' knowledge of different English-speaking countries and inspire students to research different English-speaking countries and their associated customs, traditions, and even uh, accents, dialects. So I think George is going to be talking a little bit more. The, she's going to be taking over in the second half. So I'll get going. Um, the first thing I thought would be really interesting to talk about is Cockney rhyming slang. Okay? As you may know, Cockneys are generally people uh, traditionally from the centre of London or even the east end of London. To be honest, they're sort of a dying breed now since if you live in the centre of London, you might be an oligarch or <laughs> someone very rich, okay? But uh, uh, it's an ingenious way of speaking that was originally developed in the 19th century, allegedly to avoid police scrutiny. Okay? Um, it is also dispersed throughout the world, so it's not just in uh, the, in in London. In fact, uh, we often use it in Australia, where I'm from, as well. Okay? What makes this slang different is that it actually uses rhyme and then actually the removal of rhyme to invent new terms for common words. Okay, So a word, a phrase, or a phrase was rhymed with the original word. There is an example. For example, you might, if you want to say look, they match that with butcher's hook, which is the big hook that you, they hang the, the meat on in a, in a butcher's shop. Um, therefore, Look becomes butcher's hook. The ingenious thing about Cockney rhyming slang, that is the ingenious way that they used it to avoid police scrutiny or even just as a bit of humour or to uh, sort of have a what we call an in-joke, okay, is that the rhyming part of the slang term is often dropped. So instead of saying look, instead of even saying butcher's hook, okay, now you just say butchers. So if you don't know that middle term, you know, butcher's hook, you're going to have no idea whatsoever. And that's still quite a common expression. Okay? So, I mean, I would even say that 
you know, with my friends, you know, oh, take a butcher's at this. So take a look at this. Okay? Um, have a look in that uh, uh, the, the thought bubbles there. He's saying uh, he's thinking I've run out of bees and honey. Can you Adam and Eve it? See if you know what uh, he means there. Think of something that uh, rhymes with honey and something that rhymes with, well, part of it, Eve. Okay? Um, and it, generally they're going expressions like that. Again, these ones, the examples in that, that picture are not with the part removed. So the removing the rhyming part is an option, okay? often uh, to make it more difficult, but it's not always taken up. So you can say a butcher's hook quite common just to say a butchers. I have created a uh, worksheet here. Okay, it's a little bit small there, but there's some questions there that you that will be on the handout. And uh, this will relate to the video here that we're going to watch. So have a look here and see if you can work out from this a couple of questions. I'll tell you them here. What are apples and pears? Okay. Um, what part of the body is your boat race? Okay, you might know already, but let's have a look at the video. It's a couple of minutes long, and uh, we're going to see a lot of these. Uh, the, the meanings are on there, and I've included the link in the handout. Okay, So let me just uh, add the uh, optimize for the sound. Okay. Hi, my name's Ed. Welcome oh. to Ed Explains English. Hang on, wait a second. I think I've. Uh, can you see the video, Georgia? Can you see the video? No, Doug. No, I, I don't. I can hear it, but can't I see it. Don't know why it stopped sharing. Hang on, let me just try that again. Okay. Um, let's try that again. Hi, my name's Ed. Welcome to Ed Explains English. Learning English through stories. Have a butcher's at this photo, Ed. Do you know any of the people standing in front of the apple and pears? Of course I do, Judy. The man in the whistle was my grandfather, and the woman next to him was my grandmother. Yes, I thought I would have recognised their boats. I've seen them in other photos. It's probably because of the way they were dressed up. My grandfather was as bald as a coot, but he was wearing a syrup for this photo. I don't know why. They were probably going to a fancy dress party. Even though it's a black and white photo, I can see that his trouble and strife, your grandmother, had beautiful mince pies. Yes, they were deep blue. Do you recognise those dustbin lids sitting in front of them? I guess they must be your father, Ed Senior, and his skin and blister, Mary. He looks a bit Tom and Dick. He told me he had eaten a big Ruby Murray before the photo was taken. So he was in a right to an eight. Yes, he looks like he was. Your auntie looks older, but otherwise the same. I think she's still got that weasel and stoat she's wearing, and this photo is nearly 50 years old. Happy days. Not always. I remember it was Tatus in their house. His best china stand was a tea leaf, and often came round to duck and die from the police. He used to wear a tit fur, to try and disguise himself. Did that work? Not really. The coppers could recognise his plates of meat from 100 metres. He wore size 15 shoes. He had a very distinctive north and south too. Anyway, when the coast was clear, my granddad and Stan would take a ball and chalk down to the rubber dub. Leaving your grandmother on her tod with the kids, what did Stan use to half inch? Teapots. Teapots? You're having a giraffe, aren't you? He was a tea leaf who stole teapots. I think I've heard it all now. Yes, it's all a bit girt and daisy when you think about it. Talking of teapots, we could do with a nice cup of Rosie Lee. I suppose you want something to eat too. Yes, please, Judy. This nostalgia has made me Hank Marvin. Okay, as you can see, it's, it's almost like another language there. 
needed. Uh, we would like to oh. thank you for watching this. Okay, just pause that. Okay, but uh, it's it's one of these really fun things. I think I think you could put that in a class video and uh, have uh, people really enjoying it. The students enjoying it. Okay, so what you could do, I think, as a follow up activity. As I said, we've got the worksheet there for you. The answers are also in the handout. But uh, after watching the video and completing the worksheet, why not ask your students to make up some rhyming slang of their own? This is actually something that uh, it is, even though it has origins, you know, more than a hundred years ago, it actually uh, is still evolving. I know there's uh, quite a common. There's a popular DJ in the in the UK called Pete Tong, and uh, it's quite common to say everything has gone Pete Tong, which is a way of saying everything's gone wrong. And I must say that one can't be more than about twenty or thirty years old because he hasn't been around that long. So these things are still evolving. Angela had it pears and out. Well, actually, apples and pears are stairs, and your boat race is your face. Okay. As you can see, some of them from there had the rhyming part, some of them didn't. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just seeing that some people have uh, raised their hands. Okay. Um, what you could do also is, I mean, you could start it with uh, some objects in the room. You know, they could talk about family members, mum, dad, brother, sister. Anything rhymes with brother, but uh, or sister, but uh, you know, places in the local area. Okay. In this case, it might be easier to keep the writing part. Each student could create a sentence or even a dialogue, a bit like what they had in that uh, video, to demonstrate to the rest of the class. So, you know, these sort of slang terms, particularly uh, Cockney rhyming slang, it encourages you to get involved, to be creative. You know, it's very hard to start your own slang term, but when it's rhyming, you know, you, you can get it. Also, rhyme's a good thing to... Uh, uh, check students' pronunciation, given that uh, English rhymes don't necessarily show up in the spelling. You know, something can rhyme without having a similar spelling. Okay. After that, the other students try to guess what the slang terms refer to. So it could be a quite a fun activity there. Okay. Um, you notice from the pictures there, hello, I'm on the dog and bone, the phone. Okay. To be honest, that's something my friends say. It's quite common in English, sorry, in Australia. I think it might have its origins even in the fact that uh, Australia was founded by convicts who often came from uh, from London. So quite possibly they brought it with them. Yeah. But uh, it's a really good fun thing that I think your students could uh, start to uh, do some research on. I thought it wouldn't be fair talking about uh, Anglophone culture without talking about Australia, where I'm from, and uh, something that uh, you may have tried. Uh, it's a traditional Australian cake, although New Zealanders will probably say it's from New Zealand, but you know, we don't believe them. Okay? Um, Australia, you may be surprised to see that Australia has a proud culinary tradition. Um, it is a multicultural country. Currently, about 30% of all residents were born abroad. Okay? Obviously, many people in this webinar will know that there's a lot of Italian people of Italian origin, but uh, so we have a mix of traditional UK staples such as pies and roast meats. They mix with an Asian influence. Obviously, we also have influences from the European nationalities, particularly uh, Italians, uh, Greeks, a lot, depending on the city. Um, Asian influences, given that uh, we have a I mean, Australia is closest to the Asian continent and a lot of tourism, uh, Australians go to Asia as tourists. And also local produce, we have uh, temperate zones and tropical zones. So we have year-round produce. Okay? Um, in my opinion, my humble opinion, one of the most delicious cakes in the world comes from Australia. Okay? Um, it, although it does maybe indicating our uh, multicultural origins, uh, does have a Russian name. I believe it's not pronounced correctly, but uh, we call it Pavlova, although I think it should be Pavlova. Okay. Um, its origins are a little unclear, but it's 
claimed, certainly according to Wikipedia and other things, that uh, it was invented in my city, Perth, to celebrate the visit by the Russian ballerina Anna Pavlova. It is, as you can see, it uh, it is a uh, cake that has a lot of cream on it and it also has meringue. So the story goes that a chef was creating a meringue and this meringue, when he took it out of the oven, it cracked and it wasn't cooked properly. It was still soft in the middle. So to cover his mistake, he topped it with whipped cream and then put some colourful fruit on it. Um, I'm not really sure if they know how the ballerina's name came to be attached to it. They say that it was, uh, you know, in honour of uh, her visit, but I think they've researched that she never actually visited Perth, so I'm not very really sure if that's true. But it is an essential part of any uh, Christmas dinner in Australia. Remember that Christmas in Australia comes in the middle of summer. So this is, uh, as opposed to many uh, British cakes, which are often served hot, puddings or whatnot, for example, Christmas pudding. Yeah, um, Christmas Australia, pudding. Yeah. A great one too. Right? Um, we often eat this one, although if you're, if you're in a family like mine, you often eat both. Okay. I have included a pavlova recipe, I mean, for your own sake, if you want to cook this, uh, but uh, also to use in class. I think uh, these recipes are great. and We're going to have a look a bit later. Um, George is going to be talking about some traditional British food, which, again, is quite common in Australia too. Um, and... Uh, they're really useful because they contain many verbs that are not familiar to students. To be honest, your students might not even know these cooking verbs in Italian at the moment, but uh, you know, there are a lot of verbs that, that, you know, cooking verbs, things like thin or bake, okay, which are not generally things that you'll find in, uh, in other uh, terms, but you need to know them if you're going to read recipes. But... They also are useful because they, while you have the unfamiliar verbs, the actual ingredients, sugar, lemon, egg, cream, should be quite familiar. So it sort of mixes that. Plus, these recipes give a great motive to, 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 to learn it so that they can actually cook it. You could give the students the recipe and see if they can research any vocabulary they're unfamiliar with. Perhaps some of them, if you're lucky, some of them might even cook it and bring it in in the future. I think these are always good with a follow-up activity. So maybe using the Pavlova one could be the start and then ask students to research the cuisine of an English speaking country. So give a group or a pair, Ireland, give a group, New Zealand, give a group, Australia, Canada, America, and then, you know, also Britain, you know, the, the, the nations in Britain, like Wales, Scotland, England, Northern Ireland, Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, these sort of things. And uh, they can find the, the history. Remember, just like in Italy, a lot of these dishes have a tradition behind them. The name is often a tradition, just as in Pavlova. And uh, you know, they can find out when it's eaten and they can uh, find out a, a, um, the actual recipe. Who knows? Even they could uh, vote on who, which one they'd like to try if they present it to the class. Okay. I'll hand over at this stage to Georgia, who's going to tell us a little bit about May Day. Thanks, Josh. Okay. Um, I thought we could talk about May Day um, and maybe I could give you some ideas on how to structure a lesson in May Day. Um, this is a, something that's coming up soon. Um, so I thought it was in theme, um, it's a very um, important spring festival in England. Um, it's, of course, on, on the 1st of May. Um, together with May 1st, um, there's always a May Day bank holiday on the first Monday in May, um, in May each year. So, um, as you know, um, do you have a bank holidays in Australia still? We don't call them bank holidays. We just call them long weekends, but okay. uh, the same sort of concept, yeah. Okay. okay. But we don't have them actually fixed for no reason. We usually have them for an event like, you know, the, I don't know, 
some sort of uh, National Day, Australia Day, or something okay. like that. Okay. Well, British people are very fond of bank holidays, especially in May, because if we're lucky, we actually get, and we get like, good weather um, on the bank holiday. People like to party. And just to clarify, I think, you know, when we're talking about a bank holiday, we're not just talking about the bank. Um, the idea is that it's a, it's generally a Monday holiday, isn't it? Yeah. And it's a public holiday Monday, so, you know, you can have a long weekend. Okay, mm -hmm. but it, they still call it by the term bank holiday because I believe it originally said that banks had to be closed. Yeah. Um, so it, it basically marks the beginning of summer and warmer weather, uh, which if you've ever been to Britain, means around 20 degrees Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is, wow, okay, for British people. Um, it's, um, it actually symbolizes uh, many things. Um, in the past, it was actually, um, it, it's been celebrated since Roman times. Mm. Um, so in, in the past, um, it began as a celebra celebration of the um, Roman goddess that was called Floralia. And she was the goddess of flowers and good weather and animals and basically she was the goddess of spring and in the past it was the only day that farmers had off work so oh, wow. they would work um all year round even on christmas day because i researched that uh, the only day they would have off would be May Day um, because that would be the day when they would be celebrating the goddess and asking her for a good crop. Um, yeah. yeah, so good crop, um, good number of um, fruit, vegetables, good quality, so they could basically. Um, and they had these celebrations with, uh, I think you can see a maypole there, can't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, yeah. Morris yeah, there. yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, nowadays, um, they, well, nowadays and in the past, because we went from Roman times celebrating Gloralia to the, like, more modern times, where a girl from each village and actually each town was chosen to be the maid queen. She would represent the goddess, of course. Um, the maid queen would sit on a decorated throne. Um, the throne would often be decorated by the kids from the village. Um, and she would wear a crown to represent, of course, like I said, the, the goddess. Um, in some parts of England, they still actually celebrate it that way. Um, and it, it's a very big celebration. There is a town in Yorkshire where um, there is the biggest maple and well the tallest maple and where they do the biggest May Day celebration. I, I've actually been there and it's very nice. Um, in the past when a carnival happened uh, a lord or a lady or a king and a queen uh, they would be chosen and the man would be called the green man um, to represent the cross. So she, the queen, would represent the goddess and the man would represent the cross. So um, nowadays, um, queens and queens are the girls and boys from the village. But like I said, unfortunately, not all villages celebrate May Day in this way anymore. Um, there are many processions um, around the UK. And when they do have a procession, um, people are dressed in very formal clothes. Um, and they basically, like I said before, it's a celebration of summer mm -hmm. uh, it, it's in hope of good weather okay um they they still have the crowning of the queen in some places but unfortunately that's like we're, we're losing that celebration for instance um in the town where i'm from bedford we don't really do anything anymore i remember when i was younger we would have a parade um on the high street 
uh, but now that's gone. So they decided not to do it anymore, which is a shame. Mm. Okay. Um, one of the best things um, about May Day um, are um, the the poles, the May poles. Um, they basically uh, mark the beginning of summer, like I said before, and people dance around the maple. Um, in the past, kids would actually wrap the pole with strings, red and white strings. Um, often now the pole is already like um, white and red, but people still do dance around the maple in parks where they, of course, do celebrate May Day. And the dancers are called Morris dancers. And it's linked to an old tradition where people wouldn't be dancing around the pole, but they would be dancing around a real tree, okay? Again, to celebrate summer, to celebrate nature. Um, we don't really know when this tradition began. Um, like I said, yeah, they would be threading colored ribbons around it until it was beautifully decorated, like the one in the picture. Um, uh, like I said before, the Yorkshire village uh, of Nunmonton, uh, they have the tallest maple. It's actually Warwick in Elmet as well. They're very small villages in Yorkshire, oh. and they have the tallest maple. The dancers are called. Morris dancers, and it was at the beginning only done by men. Um, nowadays, it's men and women dancing around pole. And it's traditional to dance up the door. Okay, that's a very nice expression on the morning of the 1st of May in order to welcome the summer. Okay, so people would wake up very early go to the park, go to wherever the maple is being um, played, and they would be dancing, okay? The dancing starts around 5 a.m. Um, until the sun is up, so around 4.30. Uh, and then they go and have a traditional breakfast. That's the tradition. Um, I've never actually danced around the pool, but uh, I've seen many more dancing, and, uh, and it's very nice. It's funny, isn't it? The Morris dancing. They they well, they have scarves and things. I think they yeah. wave around. Yeah. Yeah. As you can see in the in the picture there and on the pictures in the previous pages. They, mm -hmm. Usually dressed in white and they have a head scarf. Yeah. I think I uh, I, I in, in there's a few links in the handout to to um, May Day celebrations and things like that. So if you're interested in looking further, then you'll see it in the, the handout. There are many activities that could be structured around um, the May Day celebrations because we also celebrate May Day in Italy. So um, yeah. it would be nice to look into the British traditions um, and then compare them to the Italian tradition to be a good lesson, lesson on comparative and superlative. Why not? Yeah, I think that's always a great great way you know even same thing with recipes you know contrast british or australian or whatever recipes with italian ones you're still if you're describing them in english you're still doing you're still using english and to be honest it might even be more helpful if they're you know talking about these these things that they know well and then they can move on to things that they know less well so oh, angela it actually it celebrates the start of summer it celebrates, like I said before, flowers. Um, in the past, farmers would hope for a large number of crops, good weather, and the mark the beginning of summer, okay? So, and good weather. Like on May Day, um, there are loads of, I found loads of different um, articles and loads of different extracts that could be used to teach vocabulary. There are many particular words like maple, like Morris men. Um, so there's loads to do on reading comprehension, expanding yeah. lexicon. So um, it's always useful and it's always interesting to 
speak about different traditions. Yeah, festivities and things are great things. So they can, you know, pick a festivity in their own country or own city, to be honest, you know, and uh, contrast it with somewhere, someone in another place, an Australian traditional day, Australia Day, for example, the 26th of January, or, you know, some other Independence Day, 4th of July in America would be interesting. These sort of things are always great ways. Uh, and to be honest, they're often things that come up in exams, you know, that they, they're, 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 they have to write about a tradition, they have to write or speak about a festivity they went to or that's traditional in their area. Mm-hmm. Always going to help them. Absolutely. Um, I um, brought in a very British um, recipe. Um, I'm sure many of you um, know uh, about hot cross buns. They're typical um, cakes we eat during the Easter period, um, not just in the UK, but actually um, across the English. Yeah, I, I grew up eating them in Australia. And I was there at Christmas and the 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 day the shops open after Christmas, there are already hot cross buns there. <laughs> yeah, we always tend to give give take them out in advance. Um, and um, they um, symbolize um, Easter, like I said, and they're symbolic because on top they have a cross, um, which represents the cross on which Christ died. Uh, and the spices in the hot cross buns are said to represent the spices that were used to embalm Christ after his death. So they're, they're a very, um, they have a very big meaning um, for Christians. Um, I think when when we talked about these in our Easter webinar, we did mention that they're probably the closest taste to them is something like panettone. Mm -hmm. I always thought it's sort of similar taste, although the bun is like a lot smaller. It's a little bit more spicy um, compared to panettone. It's got cinnamon and nutmeg and yeah. And Okay, there. So, like I say, they are linked to Easter and Christianity, but in reality, um, they too are linked to a goddess. This time, a goddess of fertility, um, a Germanic goddess. Um, it is said that actually Easter is named after this goddess. So, that, I thought that was interesting. Um, she was a blonde. Goddess, and she was always surrounded by birds, bunnies, and other baby animals. And of course, she symbolized spring as well, and spring flowers. So it's all linked. Yeah, I think it's always good. Uh, as I said, those sort of festivities, the idea is also, even if you pick one as famous as Easter or Christianity, you can see how, how it changes around the world, you know, considering that, for example, uh christmas is coming you know in summer in some english-speaking countries in winter or in others um easter at the you know the beginning of summer or sorry in the middle of spring or they it's in the autumn in other countries so you know obviously foods and traditions change even though there's sort of some familiarity of the sort of christian christian origins of some of the traditions but as you say, even, you know, pagan traditions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, cross buns were baked for the spring festival to celebrate this goddess. Um, in this tradition, well, in, in, this, um, in this story that I found, they didn't represent the cross, but they actually represented, the cross on top of the bun represented the four different phases of the moon, okay? Mm. So, um, well, the four parts represented the four phases of winter, and the cross symbolized the rebirth after winter. So, it's a very symbolic food. And it's nice to to know the different meanings and to also, like, teach them. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Um, As as, 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 as,
Yeah, let us know. We did. Uh, we we had a recipe. We included a recipe in our Easter webinar that was. Uh, uh, I think it was about a month ago. We just gave you a bit of time before Easter. We didn't want to spring it on you just before Easter. But uh, if you're curious, if you want to know more about them, or if uh, you're interested, uh, I've included a link to the webinar on Easter. And uh, if you participated on that, you will have the handout there. If not. Feel free to write to me, and I can get that hand out to you. And it's got a recipe there, but uh, I think they're—I don't think they're particularly hard to cook, but they're really delicious, okay? particularly with a bit of butter and grilled. Okay? Getting hungry now. Okay? Angela is, is right. Yeah. There is a small song, okay? which we actually had in the Easter webinar too. Okay, Hello. so okay? hot mm. cross buns, hot cross buns, one a penny, two a penny, hot mm. cross buns. Okay? There are all sorts of <laughs> there are all sorts of activities that could be linked um, to the recipe. Um, what I often do is before giving the whole recipe to the students, um, I actually tend to cut it up into different parts and give it to the students. They work in pairs and then they have to put it in the right order and then I give it to them. Yeah. Um, something I did. Um, during COVID um, was also giving out the recipe and then having the students look, we had loads of time <laughs> at the desk, like during COVID and during the pandemic, kids would actually have to make the recipe at home and do a video um, of them making it, like describing what they were doing. Um, and I found that that really helped their confidence in so it's an idea, something that could be done. Yeah, I think there's nothing like doing while you're learning. You know, it really, I think it also, the, the, the more you're sort of moving and doing something, the more sort of it goes into your mind. If you're sitting there just listening to someone, it's not going into your mind as much as if you're, you know, measuring out, you know, how are you going to teach them how, what, what uh, I don't know, need means unless they're needing okay what unless bake they means it. unless they're putting it in the oven you know it, it's going to go in their mind much easier okay? and the ingredients the same thing if they're seeing and smelling you know cinnamon okay you once you've smelt cinnamon you're going to remember it forever and the word will be associated with it i think kids are very often you know active learners mm. and, and and also um at the moment um, there is like the um, cooking programs are very popular. So mm. it, it, yeah, like for instance, I have my son. Um, he's like coming to the end of um, primary school. He's a great fan of master chefs, and he loves cooking. So you can get kids involved, um, learning and doing stuff. So and we have many students from um, upper school too that enjoy cooking. It, it, it's a hobby. It's also a hobby for boys. So it'd be a good idea. And they could be making something different. And, yeah. Um, it's sort of different most, position. One of the most popular British TV shows, uh, The Great British Bake Off, you know, with cakes and things like that. So for sure. Yeah. Anyway, just coming to the end, uh, we've got some conclusions here. I'll let uh, Georgia continue on with these. So using traditions from other cultures um, can be a fantastic way of teaching your students new vocabulary. Um, so on May Day, for instance, um, cross, there are loads of crosswords. Um, I found loads, maybe, I am sure. I, I can either send Josh the links and um, yeah. Josh can send them to you. Crosswords, for example, for middle school, word search for primary school. It's a great way of teaching um, new vocabulary. Um, conveying lexicon and grammatical structures through stories and international celebrations can be highly motivating for students. Um, it could be a good way of um, doing a different lesson, okay? So moving away from the traditional um, topics and giving them an actual insight. I always find that when I speak about British traditions or traditions in general um, from the English speaking world, students are always very um, 
they follow and they they want to know more and they ask questions yeah because i think it is you know it is a cultural experience learning a language not just a linguistic one and uh you know like i must say uh you know english speaking culture is covers a lot it's not like one country we're talking about parts of you know countries in every part of the world and so uh you know there's always something to a new thing to investigate unfamiliar foods unfamiliar um traditions and the associated language with that and very different countries very different traditions also between themselves like uh, british tradition would be very different from the american tradition yeah traditions and from australian tradition so there's loads of stuff to explore and at the same time promoting different food and recipes for students can recreate at home can be a great way of teaching writing connection and different tenses absolutely um so they could be writing like after they've experimented um making baking um a recipe they could actually write in english their favorite recipe their favorite cake and that's a great way of and especially a fun way of practicing writing and um, using connectors for example if we look at the more advanced levels um it's a great way of practicing putting things into sequence and Angela asked, oh, sorry antonella asked what age students should be i look in my opinion there's this rest if we're talking about recipes there's recipes simple recipes mm -hmm. or difficult recipes i mean you know there's a lot of recipes that don't require cooking Exactly. So, you know, it doesn't mean you have to do make a pavlova or something like that, which is a bit more difficult. You know, you can even uh, work out, you know, hot dogs, things like that for America. So, um, marshmallow rice cake. It's always hmm. a popular one. Um, yeah. Marshmallow, rice crispies, done. And that's yeah. it. It's very American, but it's a recipe. Yeah, but then going on to, to higher level students, then, you know, they, they might be interested in cooking themselves at home and uh, therefore give them a more complex one okay, to research. Again, it doesn't necessarily always have to finish up in name cooking. It could just be looking at the tradition, looking at the language. Okay? And the, the keener students, the more enthusiastic students might want to do the cooking. But, uh, you know, whether you carry on with the cooking it's it's an optional absolutely exactly. yeah yeah so anglosphere culture is multi-ethnic and so varied that you could literally create weekly lessons on it um so start researching there are so many more interesting foods to talk about than just fish and chips yeah we we tend to associate especially britain um to fish and chips okay we don't have the best cuisine in the world but there are many things that are good and many things that can be used um in, in english yeah and i think i mean i in my opinion anyway british food gets a bit of a bad reputation but uh i don't think it's always deserved so, you know there's a lot of badly cooked food in 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 places if you're trying to eat cheap in london then quite possibly you will be eating badly but i mean to be honest i think that's that's in many parts of the world if you're trying to eat cheaply uh in expensive cities so you know if you research it a bit more i've eaten very well in britain and to be honest not just british food you know british food now is also curries um you know a lot of other things and to be honest as i said about australia too so you know the the multi-ethnicity of english-speaking countries is, is one of the key things whether it's america britain um australia you know these sort of countries are made up of people around the world you can get fantastic italian food in australia okay, and you can get uh fantastic asian food curries and traditional british food as well and even fusion australian things like that with you know natural ingredients that are only found in australia mm -hmm. things like that so you know i think uh the, the traditions of food don't dismiss english food because you had a uh, 
you know, I don't know, a bad burger or some bad fish and chips in London one time, you know, try again, try. I always advise people to check out uh, Indian restaurants when they go to, to England. You know, As Angela rightly food. said, um, curry is a very popular dish and mm. it's actually a national dish in the UK. Like you have right, exactly. Right. All the time. So well, we'll look, see. coming to an end, I just want to um, ask you for suggestions. Uh, someone did ask about a webinar on uh, phrasal verbs. Uh, I am looking at having one of those very soon. So um, if you were keen on one of those, stay tuned. It's coming up. Um, but let us know with other ideas. Let us know even if there's uh, traditions that you would like us to speak about. You know, all of these webinars, particularly this um, this week's, could certainly be repeated with totally new content. You know, talking, we didn't even touch on Ireland, America, Canada and uh scotland wales so you know we could we could talk about uh a lot of different things there okay so let us know in the chat or email me and the email is there if you need us um uh remember that i just repeat that uh anything you want to that you've seen in this webinar will be contained in the uh the handout as well as some worksheets and a lot more okay angela i I'm researching, I think you mentioned this before, I am mentioned, looking into the, the uh, 2030 development goals, okay? So for sure, okay? Um, series Maria talks about, yep, that could be a great idea. We have looked at uh, touching on that. I might ask uh, my colleague Luca, who presents webinars sometimes, and uh, he's a great one in uh, acting, screenwriting, things like that, okay? Um, Scottish traditions too. We'll have to find a Scotsman to, to do it with me. Okay? Um, anyway, I'd like to send a big thank you to Georgia. Thank you. Okay, who prepared this and came up with the idea of it. And uh, finally, I'd like to just tell you that our next webinar is in two weeks. Next week is, uh, I don't even know how we say it in English. What is it? Holy Thursday? Or... Yeah, Holy Thursday. Okay, I know Giovanni Santo, but I don't know probably Thursday. But uh, um, anyway, so we'll skip next week. And I so wish you a great Easter, and I'll see you again in two weeks. Okay, have a great Easter, and again, thanks a lot, Georgia. Okay? Thank you. Happy Easter. Okay, happy Easter, everyone. Bye bye.